Now, it's been a mystery for 500 years, and now scientists have confirmed that a skeleton found under a Leicester car park is that of King Richard III. The DNA from King Richard III's bones is telling us a story that history books have kept silent for centuries. It's a tale of a shocking family secret hidden deep within the royal bloodline. We're not just talking about the famous mystery of the princess in the tower. The genetic analysis revealed something far more fundamental a discovery suggesting massive deception at the heart of the English monarchy. The thing nobody tells you is that the right to rule was based on blood, and Richard's blood tells a very different and much darker story. A king beneath the car park. For more than five centuries, King Richard III's final resting place remained one of history's greatest mysteries. Historical accounts recorded his death at the Battle of Bosworth in 4985 the final major confrontation of the brutal Wars of the Roses. Records indicated his body was transported to Leicester and buried unceremoniously at Greyfriars Friary. But as centuries passed, the friary was demolished and its exact location faded into legend. The king's grave was thought lost forever. Some rumors even suggested his bones were exhumed and thrown into a river during the Protestant Reformation. Most historians had given up hope of ever finding him. That all changed in 2012 when archaeologists began an unlikely excavation in a Leicester City Council car park. Historical maps suggested the ancient friary once stood at that precise location, its foundations buried beneath layers of asphalt and concrete. Few expected to find anything significant, let alone the remains of England's most controversial king. Then, the impossible happened. If I'd put this trench in 50 centimeters further east, I'd have missed it entirely. Within days of breaking ground, they uncovered a human skeleton. What many initially overlooked was its location, in the area believed to be the Friary's Choir, precisely where historical records said Richard III was laid to rest. The skeleton, initially designated simply as Skeleton I, possessed features that immediately grabbed attention. It belonged to a man in his early 30s. Richard III was 32 when he died on the battlefield. The bones bore unmistakable scars of combat, at least 10 distinct injuries, including eight concentrated on the skull, consistent with vicious blows from swords or halberds. The most shocking detail? Some cuts suggested his helmet had been torn off in his final moments, leaving him vulnerable to the killing blows. This matched gruesome contemporary accounts of his violent death. But the most telling clue was the spine. The skeleton displayed severe scoliosis, a dramatic S-shaped curvature that would have caused one shoulder to sit considerably higher than the other. I excavated the legs, they seemed to be normal. I exposed the, the arms. Again, there was no sign that anything out of the ordinary was occurring. Contemporary chroniclers described Richard as having uneven shoulders, a feature William Shakespeare later grotesquely exaggerated into the image of a villainous hunchback. The bones revealed the truth. While he wasn't the twisted monster from Shakespeare's plays, he did have a significant physical condition that would have been impossible to conceal. Historical propaganda had turned a medical condition into proof of evil, but here was the physical evidence. Radiocarbon dating placed the remains squarely in the late 15th century. Chemical analysis of the teeth revealed a diet fit for royalty, expensive meat and seafood in abundance. Everything seemed to align perfectly, but it wasn't enough. For history to officially accept, this was Richard III. They needed undeniable proof, something stronger than bones and historical accounts. They needed DNA. The thing nobody tells you is that finding a genetic link after 500 years is almost impossible. The challenge was monumental. Connect this ancient skeleton to living relatives and finally solve one of history's greatest missing person cases. The bones told a fascinating story, but only DNA could reveal the shocking truth that would shake the monarchy's foundations. The DNA bombshell. With a potential king skeleton in their possession, all eyes turned to the genetics laboratory. The archaeological evidence was compelling, but the world demanded absolute certainty. Could DNA extracted from bones buried for over five centuries truly prove this was Richard III? The task was immense. Ancient DNA is extraordinarily fragile and easily compromised by modern contamination. But if successful, the payoff would be historic. Scientists focused on two special types of DNA that pass through generations almost unchanged. Mitochondrial DNA, mtDNA, and the Y chromosome. First, mitochondrial DNA. This genetic material passes exclusively from mother to children, meaning you, your siblings, and your mother all share identical mitochondrial DNA. 
Genealogists performed a miracle of historical detective work, tracing Richard III's family tree through his sister, Anne of York. They followed an unbroken female line spanning 19 generations across 500 years, ultimately finding two living descendants, Michael Ibsen, a furniture maker in London, and Wendy Doldick, a Canadian researcher. They were Richard III's great nieces, 16 times removed. When laboratory results arrived, they revealed a perfect match. The mitochondrial DNA from the skeleton was identical to Michael's and Wendy's. The odds of this being coincidence were astronomical. This was the moment the world had been waiting for. In February 2013, the University of Leicester officially announced that the remains were, beyond any reasonable doubt, those of King Richard III. Case closed, right? Not even close. The mitochondrial DNA was just one half of the story. The other half would unleash a scandal nobody saw coming. In this case, by looking at the DNA of living individuals and comparing that with DNA samples. Next, scientists examined the Y chromosome, which passes exclusively from father to son along the male line. In theory, Richard III's Y chromosome should match other men descended from the male Plantagenet line. Researchers traced this lineage back to Edward III, finding living male line relatives, primarily from the Somerset family. They collected DNA samples, ran the tests, and prepared to add the final confirmation. The results were a complete shock. There was no match. The Y chromosome from King Richard III's skeleton did not match the Y chromosome of his supposed living male relatives. Instead of confirming his identity, the test exposed a massive secret hidden in the royal family tree. Somewhere in the 19 generations separating Richard III from his relatives, there had been what scientists politely call a false paternity event. In plain English, someone's official father was not their biological father, a royal affair, a secret child, a broken bloodline. The implications were explosive. What many overlooked is that this wasn't just about some distant ancestor. This secret could undermine the legitimacy of the entire royal line. This shocking twist didn't just question Richard's past. It threatened the entire foundation of royal succession, a dynasty built on deception. The revelation that Richard III's Y chromosome didn't match his supposed relatives sent shockwaves through the historical community. In addition to having that one-to-one -one link, we also found another female line relative so that we could triangulate the... While his identity was confirmed through his mother's side, his father's side had just revealed a major fault line running through the royal family tree. The question was no longer if a scandal happened, but when and where. The Y chromosome test involved descendants of Edward III, a king who ruled over a century before Richard. This meant the break in the genetic chain could have occurred at any point across multiple generations. There were numerous possibilities, and each carried dramatically different consequences for history. If the false paternity event happened early, perhaps with one of Edward III's own sons, it would mean the entire claim of later Plantagenet kings, including Richard, was based on a lie they wouldn't have been the true biological heirs they claimed to be. Alternatively, if the break happened much later in the family line of the living relatives who were tested, Richard's lineage might be perfectly legitimate, but theirs would be in question. The thing nobody tells you is how absolutely critical bloodline was to monarchical authority. Their entire right to rule, their divine mandate, was based on an unbroken chain of succession from father to son. The most shocking fact is that a single instance of infidelity could theoretically delegitimize an entire dynasty. This discovery adds a thick layer of irony to the Wars of the Roses. That entire 30-year conflict, which saw families destroyed and thousands of lives lost, was fought over who had the more legitimate claim to the throne. The House of York, Richard's family, and the House of Lancaster both traced their ancestry back to Edward III. They spilled rivers of blood arguing over who was the rightful heir. And now, five centuries later, modern science suggests the very idea of a pure, unbroken Plantagenet bloodline might have been a complete fantasy. And that was really crucial, actually, because what if I didn't find a match between the DNA from Michael Ebsen and the skeletal remains? How do we know it's not just be because the tree isn't right? They may have been fighting over a crown that, genetically speaking, neither had a perfect claim to. Historians began scrutinizing old records and forgotten rumors, searching for clues. Suspicions fell on key figures like John of Gaunt, a powerful son of Edward III whose descendants formed the House of Lancaster. Could the break have happened with him? Or perhaps even with Richard's own father, Richard, Duke of York? Rumors had circulated even in the 15th century that Richard's mother, Cecily Neville, 
had an affair while her husband was away at war. If Richard's father wasn't who he thought he was, then Richard III never had a legitimate claim to the throne in the first place. The evidence of a secret was embedded in the DNA, but the specifics, the who, when, and where, remained tantalizingly out of reach. A ghost of a scandal haunting the pages of history. But the DNA wasn't the only revelation the Bones had to offer. Separating man from myth. While the world buzzed about the royal scandal hidden in the king's genes, the skeleton itself kept revealing secrets that separated myth from reality. The DNA revelation was shocking, but it was only one piece of a much larger story, one that forced historians to confront just how wrong centuries of legend had been. For those wondering if this was elaborate hoax or media stunt, the truth lay in the bones themselves. The physical evidence didn't just confirm his identity, it completely rewrote the story of who Richard III really was. Let's start with that infamous hunchback. Thanks to Shakespeare, the world envisioned Richard as a twisted evil villain, his outer form mirroring his supposed inner corruption. But when scientists examined the spine, they found something both fascinating and tragic. Yes, he had severe adolescent onset scoliosis. His spine curved dramatically to the right, making one shoulder higher than the other and reducing his height by several inches. But he wasn't the grotesque figure we were led to believe. His condition wouldn't have crippled him or prevented him from leading men into battle. His bones showed strong muscle attachments, signs of an active, physically capable warrior. What had once been weaponized as proof of wickedness turned out to be nothing more than a medical condition. His enemies hadn't just killed him, they'd twisted his body into a metaphor for evil. Then there was the chemical diary hidden in his bones and teeth. Through isotopic analysis, scientists traced where he lived, what he ate, and even how much he drank. The findings were astonishing. As a child, Richard moved around England, reflecting his family's shifting fortunes during the Wars of the Roses. But once he reached the throne, his diet transformed. He lived like only a king could, his meals filled with luxury meats, swan, crane, venison. The isotopes revealed he was consuming a staggering amount of alcohol. Based on carbon and nitrogen ratios, researchers estimated he was drinking approximately a bottle of wine every single day in his final years. Is it, it's confirmed that Richard III had a very high protein diet. That detail alone proved this was a man at the top of society, living the opulent life only a crowned ruler could afford. Perhaps the most haunting discovery came from reconstructing his face. Using 3D scans of the skull, forensic artists rebuilt it piece by piece, layering digital muscles, skin, and expression until a face emerged from history. What appeared wasn't the sneering monster immortalized on stage, but a composed, intelligent man with a faintly weary expression. The resemblance to early portraits of Richard III was uncanny, almost eerie. When DNA data was added, the image became clearer still. He likely had blue eyes and light blonde hair in childhood that darkened with age. For the first time in 500 years, people could look into the eyes of a king, long vilified as a murderer, and see not a caricature, but a real human being. Then came the most brutal revelation of all, how he died. The Bones recorded every moment of his final battle at Bosworth Field in 1485, when he faced Henry Tudor's forces. There were 11 wounds on his skeleton, nine on the head. Two were instantly fatal. One blow sliced away part of his skull. Another drove a blade deep into the base of it, likely killing him instantly. His helmet had been torn off, leaving him exposed. The remaining injuries suggested he was surrounded, fighting on foot, and struck down in a chaotic melee. After death came humiliation. His body was stripped, possibly thrown over a horse, and later buried hastily in what eventually became a parking lot in Leicester. And yet those bones, torn, broken, and buried in silence, told a story more powerful than any myth. They revealed a man who fought to the very end. Not the cowardly tyrant of legend, but a warrior king betrayed by fortune. The victors wrote the history, but the bones wrote the truth. The legitimacy question. This incredible discovery forces us to confront uncomfortable questions about power, legitimacy, and the narratives we construct around authority. If the royal bloodline itself is based on a secret, if the genetic chain that justified centuries of rule was broken by hidden infidelity, does it change who has the right to rule? The Wars of the Roses claim tens of thousands of lives. Families were torn apart, fortunes destroyed, and the political landscape of England fundamentally altered all in the name of determining the rightful heir. But if modern science reveals that neither side had an unbroken claim to Edward III's bloodline, 
then what were they really fighting for? Perhaps the most unsettling implication is this. Legitimacy may have always been more about power and narrative than actual bloodline. The winners wrote the histories, commissioned the portraits, and shaped the legends. Richard III was vilified not because of what he did, but because Henry Tudor needed to justify his own seizure of the throne. The DNA doesn't just expose a royal scandal. Is it just has a really simple pattern of inheritance. It exposes how fragile the entire concept of dynastic legitimacy really was. Blood was supposed to be everything, the divine right that separated kings from commoners. But if that blood was tainted by secrets, if the chain was broken by affairs and deceptions, then perhaps the monarchy's authority rested on something far more human, the ability to control the story. Richard III's bones have given us an unprecedented window into the past. They've separated man from monster, revealed the brutal reality of medieval warfare, and exposed a genetic scandal that threatens the very foundation of the royal succession. But perhaps the most important lesson is this. Truth, buried beneath parking lots and propaganda, has a way of eventually coming to light. And when it does, it often reveals that history is far more complicated, far more human, and far more fragile than we ever imagined. What do you think? Does this genetic revelation change how we should view the monarchy's legitimacy? Let us know your thoughts below, and don't forget to subscribe for more hidden historical truths.